Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Season 3 of the Inquisitive Run Podcast. I am Shaw, your host. And today it's Episode 2, and we are welcoming Emily McGuire, who is a career development coach. She's a business coach, but she has a speciality in the entertainment industry. She's a former actor and voiceover artist, and she's worked in the industry as a director, uh, career development, education, and she really does help inspire, coach, and mentor actors and people who are looking for career development and also career change. Recently, Emily's worked on, or her agency has and her clients have, worked on some amazing and very impressive projects, which include the movie Mission Impossible, Dungeons and Dragons, Sanditon, Carnival Row, Five Pounds of Pressure, and Operation Fortune. And all of these are currently available on various, in movie theaters or various outlets. Emily combines her knowledge with her postgraduate and career development to help all her clients And she helps people to see their gifts, what they're good at, their skills as well. I call them gifts, but their skills, because you do work to develop all of those skills and all of those talents. And actors still take classes and artists do as well. And Emily supports people. She mentors them. She helps them to work on their inner self so she uses mindfulness meditation yoga all those things so that their outer self comes through and when it comes to auditions when it comes to getting an agent all of these factors can play in to your confidence to your self-esteem how you come across and also getting those roles and as we know the entertainment industry is uh, day-to-day rejection so If you enter the industry already, you are faced with the possibility of rejection almost on a daily basis if you're actively out there seeking those roles. Even getting an agent can be a chore. So Emily talks us through it. She also talks about building online networks with confidence and and how to integrate daily mindfulness, which can help with all of those thoughts of negativity It can help to boost your self-esteem. You all know I'm a proponent of mindfulness. So without further ado, let's welcome Emily to the show. So Emily, lovely to see you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. It's lovely to see you too. Thank you. So I've got some questions. I really want to learn (laughs) about business. We talk about careers because that's really what we're talking about here, careers. Yeah. I want to start at the beginning. What drew you to helping people to find out, to learn, to discern what they might excel in and how they might excel, how they might move forward? What drew you to that? For years, I've kind of worked with people and mentored people. So I started out as an actor in the industry. Um, and along the way, I met some younger actors who were kind of needing direction and needing help to kind of navigate the industry. So I spent time with them, helping them. And then as I came to the industry a little bit more as an actor, I wasn't comfortable with the agents that I was actually part of, the agencies. Um, but I just didn't feel the relationships were the way that I wanted with um, an agent. So I then jumped and started a talent agency. So I made that job to the talent agency and my ethos was to work with actors in a way that I wanted to be treated when I was working with agencies. That's where the ethos of the agency came and I've got clients that's been with me, say, 10 years. It's been, you know, quite a while that I've been working with them and hopefully that's a testament to the ethos that started with my experience. Um, but I did for a few years and then the pandemic hit and I, just, I don't know if you are aware but the entire kind of acting industry came to a halt so if you can think your actors aren't earning any money I'm not earning any money and it was like well, what exactly do I do now with my career I'm kind of I'm not earning any money here how long is this going to go on for what do I do um so I kind of sat down and realized that Mentoring for me and working as a coach is something that I've always done and something that I've really enjoyed. So how could I expand upon that? What could I do? So for me, I went and did a postgraduate diploma at Nottingham Trent University. 
and that uh, was just something that I did part of the pandemic and I just want to grow and I never thought from doing it how much I would love it I absolutely adore everything that I learned and it's become a major passion of mine um, and for me even when I'm working with clients, I tend to try and go above and beyond. So even if they're paying for a service and giving them a little bit of something extra for, for me, it's about putting something good out into the universe and, you know, helping people get on with their careers. It's not just about making money. It's about helping people grow and expand and, you know, achieve their dreams as well. Because I'm at a stage that I'm, I'm doing what I love. I'm working in the industry of acting and I've also got this second passion now with careers and, I'm quite happy in what I'm doing. So I want other people to get something from that, if that makes sense. It does indeed. And if and so coaching an actor, is that different from perhaps your, because you see people in other industries, I'm sure. So how yeah. is that different when, you, when you're doing business coaching? How, how does it differ? So with actors, it's more mentoring. It's more utilizing my industry experience and the years. So I've worked in the industry since I was 14. So <laughs> we won't say how old I am, but it's been a very long time. So I use that experience as a mentor, but I also combine my career theory as well. And I use that combination to, again, help actors grow, help them navigate the industry and give them the years of my experience that I've got to help point them in the right direction. When it kind of comes to the career side, um, most recently I work in freelance, so I've worked with a bank and I've worked um, with mental illness. So I've worked for the major company and it was about helping business owners um, bring mindfulness into their life. So it was about helping them have that work-life balance. So again, that's another sort of passion of mine is mindfulness and mental illness and awareness that um, I think... <laughs> The, in, when you kind of think about mental illness in general, it's, it's hard for people outside of that experience to understand. And for me, I've got experience with ex-family members and other family members that have been through that. So for me, it's about understanding. So I have this understanding from my past. And I also have this career theory. And again, it's, I suppose what I'm trying to say is, even with the acting and even with the career, you bring in all your life experience and all my life experience over the years stems back into this specialism that I've got a career and then it goes back out again to help those people and those experiences that I've had as I've kind of gone over the years, if that makes sense. Yes, yes, absolutely. And because people often say that um, you get the most out of, you're most fulfilled when you're doing mm -hmm. something with passion. And yeah. We can see your passion for that. And you touched upon two things, mindfulness and yep. illness. How does mindfulness help? So, well, for instance, when I recently worked with the um, company that I have as a freelancer, mental illness, uh, when you've kind of got that, it can, obviously it causes a lot of anxiety, it can, that can be mental illness, it can be stress. Um, there's lots of different levels of what mental illness is. Uh, but... When working with the people that I have, they were finding blocks in terms of work was becoming consuming on them. It was consuming not only their work life, it was consuming into their home life. And there was an inability to put the blocks, but on it, to separate off work and life so that when they went home, they could let their mind rest and just really switch off and find that balance again. So part of that was bringing some mindfulness in. Some of the recommendations might have been writing a journal. So they go home after a really busy day. And as with anybody, I think, not just those who have experienced mental illness, your head can be really, really busy with the way that you can, the things you've experienced throughout the day. All of your work kind of problems are still coming into your mind and it's a complete business and you can't switch off. So by doing a journal, you sit down, you kind of write about your day, you process it, you write about what went well, what went wrong, how could you maybe approach it in future? And by pouring it all out onto a piece of paper, it gets those thoughts out of your head, onto a piece of paper, and you can come and shut down and your mind starts shutting down and you can separate off from work and just relax when you're in that kind of life and what you know home environment. Yeah, absolutely. And mindfulness, because I teach mindfulness, it's different from meditation. Meditation's not for everyone. So people who have psychotic illnesses, for instance, mm. schizophrenia, it's not good for yeah. Try meditation at all. Yeah. 
Um, and so mindfulness can help, it, and it's been incorporated into dialectical behavioral therapy, which is DBT, mm -hmm. specializes for more people with mm -hmm. bipolar disorder. I agree with you. It really can help to center you and to maybe just stop and also stop those thoughts from going round and round. Sometimes they're... Yeah, invasive like, thoughts, yeah. Basically, yeah. pressurized thoughts or ruminating, which is just going over and over again. Mm. Um, and then when you speak about mental illness, absolutely, there's a scope of things. And we do have a portion of this podcast dedicated to therapeutic modalities, because mm. my mom is a psychotherapist, but also spirituality mm. as well. Yeah. So when you look at mental illness, it can be a scope and a spectrum of many different things. Yeah. But why do you think it's important, especially for people acting too, to mm. stay mentally well, mentally healthy, just like you would do physically, you know, people work mm. out to stay physically well, people diet to stay within the right range. Mm. Do, you do all that work physically. Why is it? that we have to use things like mental, uh, sorry, like mindfulness mm. to help us stay well mentally and actors. Why? So when it comes to actors, I think one of the things we get a lot of rejection, constantly doing self tapes and you might do 10 tapes a week and you still might get a no and you might do 10 the next week and you might get a no again. And Within that, it can affect a person's confidence, it can affect your motivation levels, and it can be a real block and self-limiting belief. If you constantly get a no, you think it's about you as an individual. So by incorporating mindfulness and maybe even affirmations, which again, that's part of mindfulness, um, affirmations could be used every morning you could have this positive say a few lines to yourself that you create for yourself affirmations will mean things different things to different people so it's very individual to that person what they create so anything like um, an affirmation just to empower themselves on a morning just to realize that throughout the day even if this is going to be a rejection what can they learn and grow from that situation so even though it was a no coming back it's about learning from that there's always something some little nugget of information to learn everything that we experience in life and I think it's important for actors to understand that that even if they do get that rejection it's not about them personally it's about helping them grow and expand and going forward in life yes it is interesting in an industry like acting but I would mm. think that would be the same in maybe medicine as well there mm. is rejection but it's very difficult to get on a PhD program it's not yet yeah to become a doctor it's not you know so there's lots of air, lots of industries that mm. you could be rejecting but especially for actors because it's on a daily pretty much if you're if you're working today basis. yeah yeah and it's also connected to how you look what you sound like how tall yeah. you are yeah very personal it's very personal it's yeah. and it's personal mm. when actors come to for counseling one yeah. of the things that they do talk about often is that the rejection feels personal yeah right? yeah because you're putting your whole self into it the whole self into it and the answer to yeah. that is it is personal it is mm -hmm. however how you view it as you're talking about mindfulness yeah. can help. affirmations can help because mm -hmm. if a part calls for a six foot two white male and you're yep. four foot nine black male or black female, mm. she's not going to get the part. Yeah. Why are you even looking? Why are you even going in? Why are you insisting? I mean, I've had people insist that their agent get them an audition, they, yeah. even though they don't fit the part. It's mm. like you're setting yourself up for it. For the failure, yeah. So I think there is an intrinsic need mm. rejected over and over again. But perhaps, because, you know, Freud talked a lot about the compulsion to repeat, but perhaps there is something there about overcoming that as well. Yeah. So let's yeah. Yeah. That. That's a positive point. For this. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's about, you know, okay, I'm going to overcome this. Let's overcome yeah. this as well. Within your coaching, um, mm. it could be about everyone, not just actors, but yeah. how do you find people uh, respond? to maybe being challenged a little bit 
about the kids? Yeah, I think um, none of us like to be challenged. None of us like to be challenged in our thought processes about things which we think are a certain way. And then when you challenge and you've got to rethink it over, it's, it's, it's not just challenging the actual thoughts, it's challenging the self. So it's a complete introspection and looking at yourself from top to bottom. It's, it's not just a, a normal challenge, so it can be difficult for people to take. But I think in some ways, it, when you kind of think about rejection, again, just using that, that as an example, to challenge a person's thought process in terms of seeing it as a negative, to see it as a positive, um, I'm trying to think the best way to explain this. If you kind of think about so if there's something coming up in life and you don't pursue it because you're going to fail and you've got this fear of failure, so you just walk away from it and you just don't bother because you're going to fail, what's the point? If you kind of flip that around and you think, okay, yeah, perhaps I'm going to fail, but how can I look, look at that as a period of growth? What can I actually do about that? What can I learn? So for me, for instance, coming on this podcast, you know, I could be like, in my mind, I could be thinking, oh my God, I'm going to fail. It's, you know, it's going to be the worst thing. But within that, you've got to think, well, what can I learn from this? You know, what can I grow and what can I take away from this moment in life? Because all of life is a big learning curve and we're constantly learning and growing. And for me, if I do this podcast, I could say to myself, okay, maybe it will go 100% that I want it to go, but I'm going to learn something from it. And the next podcast that I get do, I'm going to readjust, I'm going to reframe, and I'll do it better on the next one. And I think that's the way to look at life, really. It's, even though you, you challenge that negative, you know, it's just reframing, it's reframing the thought processes. Yeah, that's brilliant. Absolutely. Because I think we all, we've all felt that. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about when people appear stuck? Um, that they may not be excelling. It mm. may appear that they're trying their hardest. They really are. They could be taking extra courses, classes. Um, mm. In a business sense, they could be going to uh, events and taking yeah. out. But something just isn't shifting. It's not mm. moving. And so how do you coach someone um, to and I know you probably have a whole process, so I'm not asking for that. But mm -hmm. just overall, uh, what would you outline for them to in, in, to work on? How could you work together on that? Um, I would say self awareness. Build your self awareness. Is there a match between self and the reality? So, say for instance, if you want to work in a particular job. Are you fully aware of your skill sets? Are you fully aware of realistically what you can and can't do? Is the job that you're going for, is it matching what you can and can't do? Or is there a, a disjoint? Is it not really connecting? And perhaps in some ways that person is setting themselves up for failure because their self-awareness is lower and they need to build that self-awareness. So by building the self-awareness and having this fuller range of understanding of themselves which you can do with a coach they can actually point you in that right direction challenge your thought processes and help you navigate that thought process building that self-awareness then means that when you are reaching out for that job there's a connection because the job that you're reaching out for is going to match what you can do so it's about self-awareness and that's the overall behind that it's just building it to that point yes and is that different from what's 360 feedback I know you mentioned that. So Yeah. So 360 feedback is using business coaching. Businesses use it with their staff and they'll have so they'll have a point where they're gonna work with their staff and they're gonna give them feedback about the review, like this is how you've been doing, this is what you've been doing, does it match where you think you are? Do you, does this match where you think how well you're doing in your job? Um, so that's where that comes from and that was some of my background of training. And when I was kind of working on that, I thought, well, couldn't this technically just be used with clients in terms of building confidence and self-awareness? And sometimes when we look in the mirror, what we see reflected back is completely different to what other people see. Um, and 360 Feedback is about working with those who are close to you, your friends and the family, people that you trust, and asking them to text you things about themselves, um, things about that person, about you. So I text somebody. 
and I say, could you text me one thing about me as an individual that you think is great or things that I should really be aware of? Those texts come in from those people and you've got these texts on your phone and sometimes there might be things in that you think, really, is that, is that how I come across? And it might actually be like, wow, I really didn't know that and it might be a really positive thing or it might be something that you think, gosh, I really need to work on that if that's coming across. So... 360 feedback is about not only building confidence but also building that person's self-awareness never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now thank you for your support you make this podcast possible now back to the show yes and that's key is just being self-aware because we won't always agree even with feedback um, mm. you know but if, I think if we keep our minds open, um, yeah. they can be wrong about us. <laughs> <laughs> they can. Um, now, so I want to talk about your recent work. I know you've done some, you've had some great work recently. You've done a lot of excellent <laughs> work recently on some movies and things. Um, and you're a bit of a jack of all trades. You've been, you've been an actor, a voiceover artist. You've done... A, a director as well, producer. So you've yeah. done many different, you've worn many hats. I have, yeah, I've traveled, but to me, that's that's life in general, isn't it? It's all about learning and growing, and I like to experience new things. I like to be pushed outside of my element. So that for me is, that's why I keep learning. It's a constant growth. And I think for me, I would get bored. If I didn't challenge myself and do new things and push myself outside of my comfort zone, I would be very, very bored. <laughs> <laughs> but um, working at the talent agency, it's um, my actors that are the hard workers. So I might get them in the room, but they're the ones that's got to put the hard work in. They've got to do those amazing self tapes. They've got to put the work in on the scripts. So even though I can credit them to my agency, it's my clients which are a credit to me in terms of the work what they put in and the reputation that they maintain by their interaction on set. That is recognised as me as an agency because of how they're behaving. Um, so it's them really that I have to be thankful for for the work that comes in. Yes, um, TV, movie, you've done lots of big. Yeah, Mission Impossible. One of the guys has worked on. Yeah, I had a great time um, meeting Tom Cruise. Um, yeah, Dungeons and Dragons with the CGI. So they've worked on that. Things we the guys work on a lot of projects, and sometimes I'm the same as them. You've got to sit in it for a long time, and you can't speak about it because of NDAs. And it kills me, and it kills. Them. Absolutely, and there's still there's things that a lot of people can't talk about. It's like being in mental health. There's things you just you're trained never to talk about, never to mention. So yeah, yes, yeah. it's very interesting though because it sounds like you're expanding. Your business is growing um and it's opening up so if somebody was out there in either in business or an actor who thought okay yes i, I think i could do a bit of coach i need a bit of coaching mm. do they have to come and see you one-to-one -one, face to face or do you offer um remote sessions how do you how would you work so i work online yeah, so I work um, that way. I can work with uh, New York as well. So uh, it means you can work anywhere in the world. So anybody in Europe can come through. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of acting work that goes on in America as well. So yeah, it works not just in the UK. It's it's Europe and the US. Um, I do work in person as well, but I do predominantly work online. But I am open as well to working with like drama schools, um, working with those which are about to graduate, so they can help that have that sort of inside industry experience. I think sometimes, um, I mean, drama schools are amazing and the work that they do, but sometimes what can be missing for some clients is the business side of acting. And sometimes it's just having that awareness from somebody who's actually in the industry already that can help sort of get them prepared and even, you know, work upon and build upon all that amazing work that drama do, schools do and just to help them when they're coming out into the industry. Yeah. Such a good point, though. So many, which we're seeing now, uh, because I believe the internet, all these people are coming out saying how badly they were treated or with inappropriate behavior and things like that. Yeah. Um, I'm currently reading. <laughs> um, I'm reading. I, I'm, I'm into documentaries and biographies. I'm reading um, an actor, a particular actor's doc, um, biography. I won't mention who, but he's talking about. Um, 
some of what he went through. And he had a bit of a stage mom. So it's not that she was negligent. I don't, from what I'm reading, but the business side, because you mentioned the business side, was lacking. There was no understanding, no awareness of perhaps how to protect him. Yeah. His son, them, you know, because she was working in the industry as well. Then they had another child, a sister working in it. So there was a lot of, they were ripped off, basically. Yeah, it happens a lot, sadly. It's very sad. And mm -hmm. hearing about directors telling him, him to do things that were inappropriate, which he mm -hmm. didn't do, uh, even at yeah. if he knew not to do. But if a parent is around, or if a guardian, I know in the 30s, 40s, they had guardians around. Um, if somebody came to you and said, right, I, you know, my daughter is 13, she wants to, you know, here she is, she's brilliant. Can you help her? Can you help mm -hmm. her? What would you suggest to somebody who's just starting out? In term, would you say in terms of how they kind of start into the industry? Yes, to move forward, being aware and... Yeah, so if they're kind of starting out, what I would say is Amdram, which used to be frowned upon, but um, I think getting involved in that, if you, especially if you're young, there's a lot of drama schools. There's a poly um, quirk drama school. They do some amazing work with the students. Um, so there's lots of little drama schools as well. They kind of work as a franchise and they're all over so that, you know, there's plenty that you can actually reach out to. So doing sort of Amdram work, student films as well, so long as you get a contract, anything like that can help you get that experience on set and go gently because, you know, acting in general when you are on set, when you're on a professional film set, is huge. There's so many different things about the camera angles, where you're supposed to stand, where the lighting is, what the director is, what they're saying, what it means. So I think doing things like that or even doing extra work just get to experience how a set work, what a director does, what a producer does, what you know, set the lighting does, just so you can get that experience without that pressure of being fully there on the camera and having to go and run. It's about taking those baby steps and just learning. Okay, but that's good advice to somebody who's starting out a drama school. You're with your peers yep. as well. Yep, student films as well. Student films are really great. You're learning from each other and you're networking and who knows, the next person who's doing the student film might end up being an Oscar-winning director. So, you know, even they're learning, so you learn together. Yes. Mm. You know, as you talk about all this, Emily, I'm trying to picture you sort of about eight or nine years old and kind of... <laughs> Like, what were you thinking you wanted to do? Everybody had some idea. A vet, veterinarian, which was completely different to what I've done and where I've ended up. <laughs> it was my love of animals. So, yeah. How lovely, though. Oh, and what detour, how did you detour off from that? What? I don't know. I think, how did I detour? I think it was... I think it was friend's neighbour. She was looking for somebody to help do some children's entertaining. I think that's what did it, really. I was kind of thinking about it at the time about acting, but I didn't really go with it, and then she needed So I ended up doing children's entertaining and dressing in a giant Minnie Mouse costume and doing children's parties and, you know, giving out sweets and doing dances and magic tricks. This is giant Minnie Mouse. Um so that's, I think, what got me into the acting even more. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed working with children, the people, and just the kind of energy that you get when you're kind of on stage and when you're connecting with people. Wow. Yes, it, it really is a bug. It is, mm. like they say, the acting bug. It really does bite. What's next, then, for this, for your talent agency? What's next? What's next? Um, at the moment, I think it's just... It's got to a stage where I'm quite happy with that at the moment, to be honest with you. Um, so, for me, I don't think there was any other changes. Obviously, it's working with my actors. It's continually coaching and mentoring them, helping them grow as an individual. And I learn from them as well. So I grow at the same time. So, it's a constant evolving process. Um, in terms of the coaching side, because I have the second business with the coaching, for me, um, that's the one which is growing and that's the one which is in flux. 
because there's new services coming in and I'm learning new ways with it being just a couple of years old. I'm constantly evolving and learning that one and adding new things and learning what works, what doesn't work and then mending it so that my clients get the best experience when they come to me for coaching and mentoring. So I would say that that's the one which is kind of the baby which is growing whereas the agency is like about 10 years old now. So that one's kind of got to a point where it's turning itself over and it's got to a comfortable position now where I've got the clients that I enjoy working with and hopefully they enjoy working with me. Did you have mentors growing up? No, I mean, so that's one of the things. And when I was back at school, we when I started my degree as my master, sorry, one of the things was I never had a career advisor at school. Nobody gave me career advice. Nobody helped me think about what I wanted to do with my life. So, I mean, for me, I dropped out of school with no GCSEs, nothing that I doesn't come out with anything um it's as i've kind of left school and realized how much i enjoyed learning and got more direction that i've kind of accrued all these qualifications um but for me there was there was nobody like that um and i think it's beneficial now that they have speakers for schools they go into schools business owners um and they speak about the jobs that they do and they raise those aspirations of children that are maybe not coming from the easiest of backgrounds, but yet they can visually see that there's potential, there is something that they can do with their lives. And it, it's things like the speakers for schools and things like that, which are beneficial now that we we never had that. You just did your GCSEs and you were on your way and that was it, um, which is a shame because, you know, it left a lot of people not knowing what to do. But that brings me on to ask you sort of, you know, because what you do is, I suppose it's a mixture of right and left brain because acting's creativity, but then your business side because you you've got to be logical, rational, and what, how do you keep creative? I love uh, being creative. One of my things that I'm doing at the moment is I'm combining the um, acting and the careers together. So I do these career resources for schools, which um, are labour market information. This is where I'm going to get um, technical now. Labor market information is it's about the skills and qualities that you need for work. So it's about, say, if you take a role, say, if you take an actor, it's about knowing the skills and qualities that you need to be an actor, the type of subjects that you need to take at school to help you to be an actor. It's about being aware of what those day to day tasks are. Um, it's about knowing where to find the information that you need so that you can acquire that information to know how to progress in the industry. So live market information is kind of a whole circle of things which is about informing the individual. So I use my creativity to create these little artworks which have all that information on just one sort of A4 sheet. So it means that somebody Perhaps she's thinking, okay, I've done math, science, I've done psychology, or what can I do with my career? I want to do something creative, but I'm not too sure. They can have a look at these kind of PDFs and instantly see something that might match the things that they you know, enjoy doing or the skills that they have. So when people talk about like a fashion degree, and I did early on, a fashion degree, what can you do with that? Well, I was lucky to get some work in fashion, but a lot of people don't it's because they like fashion it's not because they want to work in the industry or maybe mm -hmm. they're mis misguided about the industry i would yeah. think that happens with actors as well mm -hmm. they can be drawn to the shiny thing and mm -hmm. necessarily the skill that it takes yeah it's it's um you need to be really resilient in the industry because if you think i think the percentage is it's about 90 percent of actors are out to work at any one point so if you think there's 90 percent of that time that those actors aren't in work you need to find well, i suppose it's, it's having an understanding of the skills that you've acquired as an actor which is vast and how you can use that in other roles so that how can you support yourself financially whilst you're trying to get that acting work or in between acting jobs so you know i mean that awareness of what skills and qualities you have how that matches potential jobs then means you can get that support system in place you can have that backup you can have that work support on you financially so that when you're going to do the auditions you know if you don't get it it doesn't it's, well, it's obviously it matters, but you still got that financial security as well. It's not about the money per se. Yeah, that's a really tough one for actors. Why is building an online network important? I think online networking, so networking 
obviously we're in a digital age now and it's it's not important just for access it's important for everybody everybody needs to network and a lot of people shy away from it because one it can take a lot of time and it can eat into a lot of your day two it's about making connections with people and we're not always comfortable making those connections and we have to force ourselves to do it um and it's not it doesn't it, when you kind of look at digital and you look at social media there's so much out there it's what exactly do you do where do you go first you know it's just so much information so if we take for instance say um linkedin linkedin is kind of becoming the massive networking tool and it you know it didn't used to be as big as what it is but now it's it's grown and grown and grown and it's becoming a vast tool um if you kind of think about LinkedIn, there's little simple ways. So when you connect with an individual, instead of just hitting that connection button and then expecting that connection and leaving it, hit that connection. And when they do connect with you, send them a personal email, have a look at their profile, say a couple of things about their profile, be personal about what you've seen, and also offer to help as well because a lot of networking is about giving. And the more you give, the more you get back in networking. So there's little things like that that you can do, just initializing those relationships and offering help. Another thing as well is LinkedIn has a really great tool in terms of if it's a birthday or a work anniversary, you can quickly hit a button and say congrats or happy birthday. And that again is building those relationships and keeping that network flowing. So even though it seems like it's a massive thing, there's little, little things like that that you can do which just help. And then from that, you know, that connection with the person, they say, oh, that person sent me a really nice email. They were so lovely. You really should connect with them. You have all their connections coming in. And all of a sudden, your network goes from 10 to 100. So it's really, really easy to grow. But I think there's so much information out there. We can look at it and we can go, I really don't know where to start with things, especially if you're not technically minded either, which different generations aren't. For your uh, business and for the agency, because I know you've explained this two aspects to you've got your coaching and, and mentoring, I would think that comes yeah. to that, but also the coaching with the acting on the, the mentoring there as well. Mm -hmm. If somebody came to you and said, look, I, I, I'm not interested in acting, it's not to do with business, it's just to do with my career. I don't mm -hmm. know how, you know, I, they want to use you as a bit of a recruitment kind of help and I. How would you approach something like that? And this is for our listeners out there who are watching this and thinking, okay, I like what she's saying, but I'm not, I'm not an actor. Um, I don't own a business. Yeah. But I do like her and I like what she does. So, Ken, mm -hmm. what, how could you help? So, if we take, say, let's say we take for an example somebody who they've got all this experience, they're coming to a career change, they're at a crossroads and they really don't know where they want to go next. It's, it's like, if you move this way, is it going to be the right way? If I move that way, is that going to be right? And it's because of that, they're becoming mobile, they're just stopped. So what I do sometimes with clients is, and I do have a blog post on this that people can read as well if they want. So it's not a case that they have to come and pay me to get this. It's um, there on a blog post as well. So, one of the things that you can do to build your self-awareness is if you take a piece of paper and you divide it into four and in box one at the top what you do is you have um what it is what do i want from the world of work what is it that will make me happy and what you need to do is so i think five years into the future you sat out on this amazing veranda looking out to the ocean perfect you know kind of dream dream job that you're working in what does that dream job look like what's the quality of it and you write down everything about that dream job, you know, all the different qualities. Is it a case that I want to work nine to five? Do I want to work from home? Do I need to work with children? Do I need to work with adults? It's all those different little things. And you write that all into box one. Then what you do is on the box two next to it, you write down what is it that work wants from me, the day-to-day -day tasks, what's involved in that. What you should have is when you look at box one and you've wrote down everything that you want from the world of work, when you're kind of thinking about a particular job, if you say go onto a career website and it says this is the day-to-day -day tasks, when you look at those day-to-day -day tasks, are they matching everything which is in box one? Or is it a case that you're looking at the box two and the day-to-day -day tasks and going, 
So I like that and I like one and like two, but I really don't like the rest. So there's only two things of that career that actually matches to what my needs are for the world of work. So that shows you the misalignment and perhaps that that job isn't really suitable for you. So you think, okay, let's look at another career. Then you can go down to box three at the bottom, which is about the things that you can offer the world of work. So it's, you know, the kind of skills you've acquired over the years. So do you type? Do you people manage? Do you, let's think, could you play the piano? Anything, you know, that might actually match to a job. Then go back up to the day-to-day -day tasks again. Is there any kind of a match as between, you know, the ideal job and also what you can kind of offer as well in terms of skills? If there's a misalignment again, it's not the right job for you. If you want to elaborate that on even further, you can dig up box four, which is down in the bottom. And it's what does the job want from me? So when you look at a job profile online, it'll tell you not just the day-to-day -day task, but it'll say if you do this job, you need to be able to work nine to five, you need to be able to do this, you need to, you need to be able to do that. When you're kind of looking down the list, does that match again? Does it match the ideal job? Or does it match the skills that you can offer? If there's a misalignment that you like in box two of the day-to-day -day tasks, can you learn? Can you go away and train for a qualification, which means that you can match what the job wants from you? And then if there's a match between all four boxes, that's the ideal job for you. And that's very quickly done. So there is a blog post that people can read to go through that and break it down a lot more slower and a lot more in depth. That is excellent. Uh, I will put the link to the blog post in the show notes. So everybody who wants to go and have a look at that, thank you for that. Having a mentor support you can be helpful. I think so, yeah. It can make you look at things differently and make you realise it's not all a negative about you, that there's lots of things out there in the world going on. Um, and it's just to bring yourself back to that moment, bring yourself back to yourself. Yeah. But mentoring coaching is something yeah. that can help you, I believe. Yeah. I think like with a lot of clients that I speak to, they can talk about how they feel like it's something that they're doing wrong when, say, for instance, they're not getting an agent. Um, and it becomes very much internalized. Um, and then that within itself is a circular process and it just continually becomes a negative thing because they're expecting a negative outcome. Um, and it's just helping them to reframe it and understand that perhaps it's not about them. It's just about the life, life as an ebb and flow. And it's just not their time at this moment. And by adjusting some things, adjusting their reels, adjusting their CVs, adjusting their headshots, perhaps by doing that readjustment, things will change the energy. And that's where your career development consultancy kicks in. Thank you, Emily. That's been really helpful. Is there anything else you want to add if somebody's thinking, yeah, I think I could, I could use some help? Um, I do think that I'm very open to communication. So if somebody has um, something that they want to work upon and they're not quite sure if it's me that would do that, then they're quite welcome to send me a WhatsApp as a, a company phone number on the actual website or they can email me as well. And I'll always get back to people and um, drop a couple of hints in there, even if I can't help them. Excellent. Yes. And it's like a little consultation, isn't it? A consultation. We can do a discovery call, yeah. So you can have like a one-to-one -one 20 minutes. Um, and that's not just um, for me or for them. It's about making sure there's a relationship between the two of us that we can both communicate with each other. Yeah. Okay. Well, everything will be in the show notes, website, contact, and the blog post as well, because I love that. What do you do on a daily basis that keeps you centered and grounded and ready to get up in the morning and and do your work do what you do i do yoga mm -hmm. yeah i do like 20 minutes at least of yoga it can be very short to do um just to do some stretches just to sit in silence for five minutes and just breathe and stretch out your muscles um for me that centers me and sets me ready for the day it's just 20 minutes and i feel much more balanced and calm because of that Oh, yes. But thank you for that. It's been wonderful to meet you and talk to you and you learn your work. And <laughs> I keep doing what you're doing because I know a lot thank of you. actors in particular need the help. Um, yeah. Mike's, um, it's a difficult time at the moment uh, for our creatives. And yeah, both the UK and the US. Yeah, it's all over. It's a um, difficult time. 
So we sometimes people suffer for their art, literally. And um, so we, we we stand with you out there. We hope that you things go well um, and that you all get back to work and, you know, that things work out. Yeah, for the best. Yes, for the best, exactly. Yeah, for everybody, yeah. For everyone. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure you subscribe and follow on all streaming platforms. Leave me a comment and also let me know if there's any particular topics you'd like me to discuss. See you next time.